are in the middle of a sermon series titled, The Hour That Changed the World. And today is part three of that sermon series. Uh, We will be in Luke chapter 23. That's where we were last week. We're going to read on a little further. I'll ask that you stand as we honor together the reading of the Word of God this morning. Luke chapter 23, verses 39 through 43. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Let us pray. Father, this morning we, we do love you. We do need you. We worship you. Oh God, because you are so worthy of everything we could possibly give. God, we come to your word this morning and we ask that you would help us, Lord, to receive your word. I pray that you would help me to preach in the power and demonstration of the Holy Spirit. God, we pray that you would rescue the perishing this morning, save sinners, encourage the discouraged. God, break chains in this place, Lord. God, you do what only you can. And let us leave this morning knowing we have met with you, that you have ministered to us, God. Let us see your moving amongst us, God. May we Feel your transforming of our hearts this morning, God. Have your way, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Here we have the Christ crucified between two thieves. We saw um, last week in verse 33, I believe it was, that he was crucified between two criminals, one on his right and one on his left. There are no accidents in a world that is governed by God, much less on this day. The day of all days in connection with this event, the event of all events. It was no accident that God's Son was hanging there between two criminals. God had decided that the Christ would be hung there to die between two thieves. How unlikely this seemed that Jesus would be with these men. That the one who wrote the law would be numbered with the lawbreakers. Why? I believe one of the reasons is that God was showing us just how far he had to descend to help us. That there was no place that Christ would not go for you and I. I believe it was also to show us the position that he had to take as our substitute. So that we would have a better um, and more proper understanding of the greatness of our sins and the greatness of the cost that was paid in order for salvation to be brought to us. This morning I want us to kind of um, hone in on the the question of why one man got saved and another did not. I want you to sincerely consider the fact that both men were in the same place at the same time, hearing the same thing, witnessing the exact same events, and one man gets saved and the other splits hell wide open. How can this be? How is it possible? Because we would tend to think that if all the circumstances were right and everything worked like it was supposed to, that would lead to salvation. But here we see two men in the exact same circumstance 
and one man gets hard and the other melts. It's an important lesson for us to learn. It's important for you to consider yourself this morning. Where is your heart? Is it hard? Unwilling to sincerely receive what God wants you to receive? Unwilling to accept what God wants you to accept? Unwilling to do what God wants you to do? Or is your heart pliable this morning? Is it soft and and moldable in the hands of God? I think it's important for us to learn, I, I can tell you for me as a pastor, that there are multitudes of times that I struggle with the question of, can we do more? Um, this, this, is, this is my life, and my whole passion is helping people get free from their sins, and seeing people saved, and seeing... Christians that are saved, that are still struggling with strongholds, break free from those strongholds, is my passion. And, and, and I mean this as sincere as I could possibly ever say it. It means more to me than anything else in ministry. It means more to me than having numbers, more than me than having friends, more to me than having um, you know, a solid church base, more than me than anything is seeing people transformed. And so sometimes it breaks my heart when I come And I will see God moving and God trying to do stuff and some people are changed and others are not. And just like most folks, I tend to ask the question, what more could I have done? Or sometimes I even ask the question in this way, what did I do wrong? The more that I have matured in my faith, the longer that I do this and the more that I study the Word of God, I've come to see that it's not always that we're doing something wrong. I think that's a reasonable question to ask. And I think if we're doing something wrong, we need to change it. But concerning the thief that split hell wide open, let me ask you the question. What did Jesus do wrong? What did He just not do enough? Notice how we want to blame others for the poor choices of people often ourselves notice at the end of Jesus' ministry that his disciples had abandoned him and the great crowds were no longer there applauding him I would ask the question again what did Jesus do wrong nothing hanging there on the cross bleeding for you and I I'll ask the question what more could he have done? The answer is obvious. Nothing. And this is the hard reality of life change and the hard reality of dealing with people that you love and exhausting your life and trying to see people's lives transformed. This is the hard reality is that you cannot force anybody to change. You cannot force anybody to make the right decisions and more importantly from 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 a christian perspective god doesn't force anybody to that's important to understand god does not force anybody to accept him god wants you to come to him freely god wants you to come uh, openly god wants you to come upon your will your choice and as we see he will do everything possible to open the door for you. But you're the one that has to say, I'm going to step through the door and follow you, Lord. It's important for us to learn that sometimes. I'm telling you, it can be a discouraging business when you pour your heart out and and you see one man gets hard and another gets soft. It, It can be discouraging. But this morning, I want us to focus on the one who did get saved. This morning, I want to, I want to teach you and preach to you on the principle of the salvation for the sinner. How did this man get saved? In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 27, Matthew records something for us about this criminal. He tells us that early on, both of the criminals were reviling Jesus. Now Luke's Gospel just records this final conversation as they're dying on the cross. But if we see the big picture, there was a time that this man, who does get saved... He was with the other thief. 
they're mocking Jesus, they're reviling him, and then somehow at the end of his, uh, right near the end of his life, uh, right before Christ is about to die, he has a complete change of perspective, he calls out to him, he in essence asks for forgiveness and asks that Christ remember him. What happened between reviling him and turning to him? What happened on the cross that allowed one of these men to be saved and ultimately enter into paradise that day with Jesus while the other man ends up splitting hell wide open? What happened? Today I want to share with you six important lessons from the salvation of this dying thief on the cross. The first lesson as we study salvation this morning is simply that this dying thief is our representative sinner. He represents us. All of us. There is none, none who do not need salvation just as bad as this man. He was there in the last moments of Christ's life so that God might show his mercy towards sinners and his willingness to save the moment that somebody cries out. He is all of us. Something happens to him, though. He cries out, Lord, remember me. The second lesson this morning is that until a man comes to the end of himself, he cannot be saved. We see that here with this thief on the cross. We have to be um, brought down low in our own esteem before God will raise us up in His. It is incredible that even in the last moments of their lives, one of these thieves was still hanging on to his pride, still mocking the Savior. But something changes in the heart of this other one and he begins to see himself as he really is, a helpless sinner. To come to see that I am a sinner is very important. I don't believe anybody will ever truly be saved until they first see that they are a sinner in the sight of God. But it has to go further than that. It's not just enough to know that I'm a sinner in the sight of God. I also must see my helplessness. I can't just all of a sudden have an awakening that I'm a sinner. And then think, well, I'm going to fix that. And I'm going to start doing good. And I'm going to get enough church services in. And I'm going to pay enough tithes. And I'm going to serve enough missions. And I'm going to feed enough poor folks, and I'm going to give this, and I'm going to do that, and, and, and if I have enough time, I can finally pay it off. No, you are helpless to pay off your sins. And we have to go beyond recognizing that I'm a sinner to the place of recognizing not only am I a sinner, but I am helpless to do anything about it. Consider this man's particular position. He's hanging there. He's got no time to even prove his faith is real. He's got no works that can follow. He's got nobody that can baptize him. He can't live long enough to turn over a new leaf. He is helpless. Brothers and sisters, if we are slow to learn that we are sinners, we are even slower to realize we can't do anything about it. But we can't. You cannot fix your sin problem. There's nothing you can do about it. There must be this sense of recognizing before God as somehow this this man came to see, no, I am guilty. I am not like him. He is holy. He has done nothing wrong. He is the true King of kings and God of gods. And I have sinned against Him. It's His law that I've broken. It's not just your hearts that I've broken. It's not just you that I've done wrong. It's not just my family that I've done wrong. It's not just people that I've done wrong. It is the God of all gods, the lawgiver Himself. It is His law that I've broken. I am guilty before Him. And I'm helpless to do anything about it. 
The sinner must be cut off from his own works before he will ever be willing to sincerely turn to Christ. There has to be a willingness and this coming to an end of ourselves if we are to ever sincerely surrender to Christ. Number three, we learn the meaning of repentance and faith this morning. True repentance, true faith, it's more than just being sorry for your sins. It's more than just deciding you're not going to keep up in the same old sins. It's more than just changing your mind. True repentance is the realization of my lost condition, discovering the ruin of my life. It's ruined. It's over. I mean, despite a miracle, despite salvation, despite God doing something, despite forgiveness, despite new birth, I'm ruined. Guilty before God, a sinner. Danger of judgment. True repentance and faith requires what I would call this right estimation of ourselves. Coming to see who we really are in the sight of God. Notice in verse 40, the man says, Do you not fear punishment? A short time ago, he was reviling Jesus, but now he recognized his, Jesus to be the judge and himself to be guilty. Do you not fear punishment? Note that fear of hell is a motivating factor in salvation. It is not the only factor. I would argue there are a thousand reasons you need to be saved. But the fear of hell is definitely one of them. And we tend to live in this culture where the fear of punishment, the fear of hell, is something we don't want to talk about. But hell is a very real place. It is an awful place. It is a place of punishment. It is a place of darkness. It is a place of pain. It is a place of torment. But worst of all, it is an eternal place. And to think that you could be there forever knowing that you rejected the Christ. And now there's no chance to to make it right. No chance to repent. That mental torment, for me, would be the worst part. There are untold millions of people, probably billions, in hell right now, who wish they could sit where you sit. Just once. I mean, just just one more chance to quit playing games with God, to quit saying no to God, to quit making excuses for your sin and turn from their sin and repent. Billions of people wishing they could just sit where you sit right now. Hell is very real. We kind of live in this odd era of time where where hell and repentance and the blood of Jesus, they're confusing to the average Christian. Because it's something we, we don't even want to talk about. We've, we've, been, we've, we've kind of got this false perspective of God as just this God that just wants to make us more happy. We've kind of got this false gospel going out that's like, hey man, you know why you should come to Jesus? Because He'll make you wealthy. He'll, he'll make your life better. Well, you tell that to a sinner, most of the time, better means more stuff. That's what it means in this culture. That's what better means. More stuff, bigger cars, bigger homes, more wealth, more influence, more power, more things. That's what generally, in the American culture anyways, that's what better means. And so we're, we're spouting from the rooftops, Christ will make your life better. The, the, the real invitation from Christ 
is to take up your cross and follow Him. It's an invitation to die. And there is no real life, spiritual life, until after death. There is no resurrection until we first have death. And so many folks, I believe this is one of the reasons that, that faith is so shallow in our culture. They're not, they're not even coming to God for real reasons. And, and I would argue they're, they're, they're coming to a false God of their imagination. This God that looks like God, but ultimately he's got the spirit of Santa. He's just there to take your list of things you need. And instead of writing them down and sending them to the North Pole, you, you send them there in the form of a prayer. And it's just his job to take your list and give you everything you need. And if you're not getting it, it's because you've been naughty. And if you just be nice, God will give you those things. Now, I don't even like talking that way. I mean this sincerely. It insults me to say what I just said. There's a, there's a sense of fury that comes up in me when I talk about God that way. But that is the way so many people see God, and that is the way so many people treat God in this era of time, and it's garbage. He is a very real God. Heaven is a very real place. Hell is a very real place. And one of the many reasons that you need to turn to God and that people need to turn to God and that we need to have a sincerity about reaching people for God, one of the many reasons is because hell is real. And there needs to be a sense of fear in each of us. I don't want to go there. I don't want you to go there. I don't want my children to go there. I don't want my family to go there. I don't want my neighbors to go there. There needs to be a real sense of the fear of punishment. I can't help but ask the question, why? Why do we stay away from it? Why are we afraid to introduce the concept of punishment for our sins when we're trying to give the so-called gospel. I say so-called because a gospel that doesn't talk about repentance and sin and hell and heaven, it's a so-called gospel. It's not this gospel. It's not the pure gospel. Amen. Why? What are we afraid of? This man recognized punishment was coming. True repentance and true faith, it's more than just being sorry for something. It is a complete turn. It is the complete realization of who I am in the sight of God. I am a sinner that needs to be saved. And it is a complete transformation of your mind where you see sin the way God sees sin. And it's, we, we do it not because it has bad consequences. We, we, are, we, we repent not because if we don't, we're going to be in trouble. We quit our drunkenness not because it tends to affect our life in a negative way. We quit it because it's sin. We quit our lying not because people get hurt when you lie. No, we quit because we see it as evil. It's sin. It's wickedness. And so the motive of turning, the motive of changing, is because we've had a complete change of mind about what is right and what is wrong. The fourth thing we see this morning is that spiritual illumination is needed in the process of salvation. I cannot account for anything other than the grace of God illuminating this man to this man that gets saved some spiritual truths. I mean, look at where he's at. Imagine it from the perspective of this thief. Here's Jesus in his weakness. I mean, I'm talking from human perspective. He has been beaten to the point he is almost unrecognizable. He is nearing death. He is bleeding out of his back from the lashes, through his wrist, through his feet. He hardly has breath to get words out. Now, not only is that what he is seeing, but the thief is also seeing that his own disciples have abandoned him. The soldiers are mocking him. The religious leaders are mocking him. And there he is as a spectacle to the whole crowd. How did this sinner, this thief, take that man for his Savior? 
I cannot account for it any other way than spiritual illumination. Consider the progress this man has found in just a few short hours. These seven things had been illuminated to him. We can see it in, uh, in his uh, statement. He had a belief in a future life and retribution. Heaven and hell. He saw his sinful condition concerning the future. He recognized the Savior was sinless when he cried out, this man has done no wrong. He placed God as his Lord. He recognized that not only was Christ God, but that he was a Savior. He believed him to be king, addressed him as such, and he also recognized this wasn't the end for the Christ. He said, this dying man on the cross, this Jesus, he says to him, when you come into your kingdom, he took him for a king. I want to say two things very quickly on this point, and I'm going to move. Number one, we need to recognize the need for spiritual illumination concerning certain truths with God. There are certain things that it takes the Spirit of God to awaken our soul to. And if you come to church every time with the attitude of, you're just going to come through and learn something. If you open up this supernatural book every time and just treat it like a history book, and just read through it as if you're going to get something. If you show up to hear me preach and just think, I'm just going to sit through a sermon, you will spend most of your life missing something. Now, I'm not going to say missing everything missing something you need to show up to the word of God in your personal study you need to show up in the, to the house of God when you're going to hear the word of God preach with a sincere spirit and a willingness to pray God illuminate to my heart this morning truth God help me to see everything you really want me to see help me to hear what you want me to hear God I recognize that I need you to illuminate to me all that you want me to see, and I do not think that all by myself I am fully capable of just doing and hearing what you want me to do and hear, God. So speak to me. Now this needs to be the spirit of the individual. Number two, to those of us that God has tasked with the job of preaching and teaching the Word of God, we need to come with a sincere humbleness that God preaching and teaching alone isn't going to get it done. I can get everything right, I can get all my points in place, I can speak in a way that makes sense, and you can leave thinking it sounded great, but if the Holy Spirit does not move and do what I cannot, if the Holy Spirit doesn't move in your heart and illuminate truth to you, you'll be just like the thief on the one side that witnessed what everybody else witnessed, but left unchanged. This reality should keep the true teacher and preacher of God humble makes us recognize we're just a small part of the process. Makes us come to the place of falling on our knees before God and crying out to God, God, you do know better than anybody else that if you don't move this morning, it don't matter how good the music is, how good the preaching is, God, you've got to move. And so God forbid that we ever begin to, to, to lean on our own power and our own strength and think, well, we got this thing down. We know how to make song sets. We know how to form sermons. I know how to put my points in place. God forbid the day ever come that we begin to operate on that. Because that alone will not get the job done. It requires spiritual illumination in the process of salvation. Number five, the Lord answers the sincere cry of a contrite heart. So this man cries out, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus' answer isn't, hey dude, you've come a little too late, man. His answer is not, uh, you don't deserve it. Jesus said, he that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. I want you to see something about God's willingness to answer the sincere cry of a contrite heart. If you were here on week one, you remember that we, we spent some time looking at the reality that Jesus did not address the crowds. You remember, they were saying the most awful things about him. He just refused to say a word. Even Pilate wants him to speak, and Jesus really won't address Pilate much. He says, as little as possible. He's led off 
like a lamb to the slaughter. Now we know that additionally, they have whipped him, they have tortured him, he says nothing, he's hanging there. We've already read it. The people are walking up, they're saying to him, oh, you saved others, why don't you save yourself? You know what Jesus says? Nothing. And then he hears this. Jesus, remember me. When you come to your kingdom, and there the Savior goes, Phew. now I've got someone to talk with. Now I've got someone that really wants to talk to me. He was listening. We see the willingness of God to answer the sincere cry of the contrite heart. Here in the worst of times, in his weakness as he is about to die, there is Christ with the time to turn and deal with one sinner who's willing to turn to him in sincerity. You want to know what God wants from you? That's it. Sincerity. You want to know what you need to do to get in right standing with God? It's not a bunch of do's and don'ts and this thing and that thing and get, get you a good 12 consecutive church services and then start paying your tithes and, and then uh, you need to join this ministry and you need to figure out what your spiritual gift is, start you doing this. And once we get all these things here in place, then God's going to hear you. You want to know what needs to happen for God to hear you? The sincere cry of a contrite heart. And you'll bust right through all of that. The love that Jesus has for people. Sincere people willing to turn to Him. It is on such display here in a beautiful way. Christ is still dealing with one man. How awesome is that? One man. One of the most important lessons that I have learned as a pastor, as I study the life of Christ, is the importance of one person. In fact, it's part of where we got our, our name from, the well. It's John chapter 4. There's Jesus dealing with one woman. And here he is at the end of his life. This is God's son. He ought to have 40,000 people out there and a big sound system so the whole world can hear and it ought to be broadcasted worldwide. Instead, he's just having a one-on-one -on -one conversation in the last minutes of his life with one person that's willing to be sincere. That is powerful. And it needs to influence our true perspective of what success is in this fake world of a thousand followers or 10,000 followers and 50,000 likes and social media fakeness where people get more caught up in their social media presence than they do their actual life impact. We need to be reminded of the importance of one-on-one -on -one relationships, of one-on-one -on -one evangelizing, of seeing one person saved. Real success has nothing to do with great numbers. You can have a million followers and be a complete failure. Real success is about reaching souls one soul at a time for Jesus. The final thing that we learned today is that heaven is a real place. Likened unto paradise. It's a better place than here. Jesus called it paradise. This is not our home. Jesus went to prepare a place for us. That's what John chapter 14 says. You know what that means? This isn't the place, folks. Trust me, he's not super concerned about fixing up your little earthly kingdom, which is ultimately going to burn with the fervent heat. And by the way, your earthly kingdom... I don't care how fantastic it is. It's nothing compared to what lies ahead. It's a better place. It's a very real place. Jesus said, today, you will be with me. With me. You know, that's the real glory of heaven. 
not the better mansions. I thank God that I, I'm, there's going to come a time, and I, I, uh, I just thank God there's going to come a time I'm not going to get another phone call about cancer or death or hurting people. I thank God there will come a day when I won't have to sit with another mother or another father weeping over the choices of their children or terrible things that have happened or death, sickness. Heaven is going to be so glorious. But the best thing about it, brothers and sisters, it's not that we don't have bad stuff there and it's not that we have mansions there and it's not that we walk on streets of gold. The best thing about heaven is that we will be with Jesus with God God help our hearts to be refocused on you may God help our hearts to be refocused on our eternal home that we might have a better perspective about our temporary home we see the longing of our Lord for fellowship with us You'll be with me. What a blessed truth for the child of God who's passed on before us. Jesus said, you'll be with me. Not you'll be in some long distant state of sleep where you're unconscious for many thousands of years until I wake you up, but you'll be with me. Paul said it'd be better for me to go and be with Christ. Not it'd be better for me to go and take a long unconscious nap It would be better for me to go and be with Christ. But he acknowledged, but yet, there's work to be done here. This is the glory of heaven, that we are with Christ. It is a real place, like an under paradise. This morning, I conclude with a simple thought. The offer stands today. The offer stands today. God does not desire that any should perish. That includes you. This includes your loved ones, your family, your neighbors, your co-workers. Are you saved this morning? Are they saved? Nothing could be more important. This one final thought. I just want to bring our mind back to the reality that we had two thieves. One accepted and the other did not. One's heart grew hard and the other became pliable and soft in the hands of God. This absolutely has application to salvation. But it also has application to the Christian. You know, after you're saved, you'll find there are things that God does to deal with your heart. After you're saved, you'll find there are things God wants to do to change you and transform you and and make you and mold you. And, And the same thing can happen to you. Where you can either get hard and say no or you become soft and pliable in the hands of God and say God whatever it takes have your way in me maybe you're here this morning and you are saved but you've been fighting God with some stuff in your life and you know it God's warning you today don't be that one man that one woman that grows hard against me trust me God is saying, trust Him that He is good. Trust Him that, yes, what He's leading you to might feel hard, but you've got to trust that His leading is best. And then maybe you're here this morning and you're not saved and you know it. I don't know any other better way than I already have to plead with you. Turn to Jesus. Hell is a real place. And the real reason you need to turn to God this morning is not because He's going to make you rich. It's not because He's going to make you wealthy. It's not because He's going to fix all your problems. It's not because He's going to take away every consequence from the sins of your past. That's not why you need to come to God. In fact, God might not do any of those things. The real reason you need to come to God this morning if you are lost is simply because you are a sinner in need of a Savior. And God might not be able to make everything right between you and everyone else in the world but He can make things right between you and Him right now this morning as you place your faith in His Son. And repent. Turn from your sins. 
Be willing to turn from your sins. See them for what they are. See yourself for who you are. A sinner in need of a Savior. And it was a simple prayer. I'm telling you, sometimes we make it so difficult. When I got saved, I prayed two words. I said, God, I'm sorry. And then I said it again, I'm sorry. And then I said it again, God, I'm sorry. I didn't even know to say that I could be. I didn't even know to ask for forgiveness. I didn't know what to say, but I said it over and over and over again. God, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. This man on the cross simply said, he didn't know what to say. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. God sees through all of it to the heart of the matter. This was a man or a woman that was turning from their wicked ways and placing their faith in the Son of God. This morning, does that need to be you?